Thank you very much. Uh, Senator Rennick. Okay, cheers. Hi, guys. Um, look, I'm not sure who to ask this question specifically to, and you're more than welcome to take them on uh, notice if you need to. Um, does CSIRO agree with the IPCC view on the heat increasing properties of water vapour of two degrees? So they're forecasting a potential three degrees rise of which two degrees is related to the feedback of water vapour rather than carbon dioxide, or does it remain open to its impact? And I'll just quote the 2007 fourth assessment where the IPCC admitted that over half of scientists agree that clouds produce an overall cooling effect on the climate. Um, which is interesting because if it has a cooling effect, then obviously it's going to offset the carbon dioxide rather than double up on it. Um, and then later on, it says that clouds are a significant source of error in all future predictions as their role is not understood. So, Senator, while my colleague looks that up, <laughs> maybe I can just say something. Um, the things like water vapour are pretty much in equilibrium with our system. Yep. So the sun shines, the water evaporates from the ocean, it goes in the atmosphere, yep. comes back as rain. Yep. Um, that's a pretty short-term cycle. Sure. Um, emissions from fossils are much longer lived. Yep. Um, the, the, even the isotope of CO2 that's emitted is, is longer lived. So yep. it's a bit of a different time scale. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So do you... So does that mean that water vapour increases temperature or decreases it, or you're not sure? Water vapour absolutely absor is an absorber yep. um, of, of radiation. Um, it's not as bad as methane um, and others, um, yep. but it is an absorber. But the point is it's short-lived, so it doesn't tend to build up in the atmosphere over long periods of time, whereas fossil emissions do. Yeah, okay. Sure. So can you quantify the heat increasing properties of it? Hopefully, uh, have you had time, Peter? So, it's, um, so Senator, um, so obviously, um, the way that you quantify these effects is through uh, the use of the climate models. Yep. So they do take into account all of the various um, greenhouse gases, uh, okay. whether it's CO2, uh, nitrous oxide, um, et cetera. Yep. Uh, water vapour is one of those. Okay. And so I've got two climate models here. One was given to me by CSIRO and the other one by the Australian Academy of Sciences. Now, on this one, the downwelling radiation is 333 watts per square metre. And on this particular energy flow, it's 342 watts per square metre. So there's a difference of nine watts per square metre in the two different models. Now, the IPC has modelled that the increase in radiative forcing from the increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere since 1750 is 1 1.8 watts per square metre. So is the downwelling, just so that we can be clear, is the downwelling radiation um, from greenhouse gases 342 watts per square metre or is it 333 watts per square metre? Oh, Senator, I'd have to look at those two particular situations in terms of the model runs, understand yep. what's in there and what's sure. not in there, yep. and it's not possible to answer that here today. Yeah, because the reason why I raise that, that's a 500% difference to, between uh, over the 1.8 watts per square metre that carbon dioxide is supposed to um, increase the temperature, yep. so that you know, it's, it's and, heat increasing properties. So we, we're looking at these models and we're making decisions based on these models. They need to be accurate. And would you not agree with that? You would understand that there's also, um, there is no one single definitive model of the climate. Um, so you're saying that you have to run, there's a lot of uncertainty and you do that by running a range of different um, modelling conditions and you're looking at the probabilities within so that range. So we're looking at probabilities, yeah, so not there is certainties? A, it's not a deterministic model. It's, yeah, so it's probabilities, yeah. not certainties. It's, it's done on a probabilistic basis, which is a normal scientific method. Yeah, sure. Yeah. No worries. Um, so do, can you also, um, and you can take this on record, please state what the emissivity of carbon dioxide is? Sorry, sorry. The emissivity of carbon dioxide. So how much radiation does um, carbon dioxide heat, does so carbon dioxide so radiate versus convection and conduction? So, Senator, I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not a physicist, um, yep. so with the emissivity, um, yep. and obviously it changes across uh, wavelength bands, uh, there's a known um, spectrum. Yep. Uh, so we'd take that on notice to give you the most accurate answer. Yeah, sure. Um, and are you familiar with uh, Werner Heisenberg's uncertainty principle? Uh, Basically, you can either know... That I'm a physicist and I'm familiar with the uncertainty principle. Yeah. That's right. So he, he got, uh, was it Nobel Prize in 1927 for, I think it was actually the, um, coming up with the statistic probabilities of the wave function. Um, but basically, you know, we're taught this in grade 12 physics that you can either know the momentum or the position of a sub or atomic particle, but you can't know both. Um, and as a result, that's led to the, the introduction of quantum physics. Um, which, ironically enough, Einstein could never reconcile with classical physics, hence his letter to Max Born when he says God doesn't play dice. 
Um, but my, my point is, is that given that infrared radiation has a lower um, frequency and hence power, you know, power than visible light, it's very difficult to understand the properties of infrared radiation if you want to base it on Heisenberg's uncertainty problem. Principle, is it not? So, Senator, the uncertainty principle applies at the quantum level. Yeah, that's um, right. If we move into the um, classical level, the macro world yep. that we all live in, um, it, it, it's not really relevant to those. Un those uncertainties are so tiny; they're irrelevant to the world that we live in. So, if you're talking about, you know, uncertainty and radiation or absorption, those yep. things are all macro effects that you can easily quantify and measure. Well, well, I dispute that because the two models, and I've been trying to get to the bottom of this, I've got two models that give me a difference of nine watts per square metre on downwell radiation. And I'm like, well, clearly, and that's a factor of what, about 3% on the overall downflow. So these things matter. Given, given the context that we're talking carbon dioxide, radiative intensity, intensity has increased by 1.8. So in terms of relativities, you know, that, that variance is a big variance. So, so, Senator, I'm, I'm not familiar with the Academy's model. Um, yeah. CSIRO developed... It's similar. It's just got different numbers. Yeah. CSIRO developed the original models that the BOM used to do the weather forecasting. Yeah. Um, it is a fact that the seven-day forecast today is um, more accurate than the one-day forecast was uh, sure. eight, 10 years ago. Yeah. So those models have gotten really, really good over time. I certainly remember as a kid they weren't that reliable, but it's remarkable how we've improved them. Yeah. I, I think our models are pretty robust, um, yep. but again, I'm not familiar with the Academy and I don't know that they've ever produced a model for, the, for predicting weather or any of, any of the operational weather predictions that we have. So I'd imagine our numbers are pretty solid, but, but yeah, we can sure. get back.